if you transact your euros into Libra coins, well, you get just one to one, or depending, of course, of the exchange rate. But uh, if you leave your money, of course, in Libra coins, well, you never get anything from the from the um, interest, of course, which is which you actually pay into here. <laughs> All right, um, those are the things and the questions we are, I try to at least address a little bit. Um, I do this in English, I have my slides prepared all in German, so those who don't speak German, this might be good for vocabulary <laughs> <laughs> out there for you. So let me start. Um, actually, the news about Libra possibly were the most important ones since the last 10 years, because now we have one of the biggest players in the internet in the world out there who is trying to adopt cryptocurrencies for their business. Uh, they don't just do this out of fun, of course. It's, uh, there's a real, a real strategy behind that. It's not just a small feature where we say, oh, let's try to play around a little bit. Let's move fast and break things. But in fact, it's not that way. It's much more thorough and much more looking ahead in the, in the future. Because what we have with Libra here is not just a set of payment feature. It's in cooperation with the largest multinational corporations out there in the world who are all coming together well to adopt uh, a new mindset, the mindset of the Web3. So let's see how this mindset, which is coming from the cypherpunks, to which I like to be a part of, and hopefully you in the future too, are adopting it and changing it to, well, something totally else which is affecting our lives. So first of all, I have some theories, some thesis. Um, the first thesis is Facebook tries to use Libra to reinvent themselves. And they have a very nice white paper up there, but actually, possibly it won't. It's just marketing, marketing glitter into your faces to well, blind, blend you. And the other two important things which we can take out of it is, well, most likely cryptocurrencies will be much more important in the future, and we have to adopt the tools which are coming with it. So first of all, what's the Web3? Um, we have the Web1. It's the information economy. Those players out there where the Web1 was only able to do one thing, it was sharing information, reading information, and well, and that's it. The platform economy, also how I like to say the surveillance economy, is of a different mindset. It's, well, much more, um, so let's say, based on, of course, well, reading, but also on sharing information. However, as you might know, the internet is broken because of, well, not just because of the client uh, server infrastructure, but because if you own those servers, you own the platform, and you own the data, and, you, and everyone else is, um, needs you as a provider, as an intermediary to those services. And well, of course, everyone wants to have a platform. Most of them are well, um, failing nowadays, but there's a new way. It's the Web3. It's not based on data, um, uh, let's say, states or um, modes, it's, it's based on data sharing, on data democracy, and how I like to say. It means we have in the Web3 a token economy, because now with tokens, replace the word token with value economy, a digital value economy, where you are not just able to read and write, but also to transact, to sign a virtual digital contract, a smart contract, with um, other providers, with sensors, with machines, in an old-fashioned peer-to-peer manner with how it was, how it was possible in the early, early days. You didn't need an uh, intermediary, you didn't need it Facebook, you just did those things decentralized and peer-to-peer, -peer, and that's the idea of trying to bring back. And those who are trying to do that are, are those tokens about which I want to speak at the end. So that's the Web3. Web3, of course, means the end of Web2. And this me means it's an extinction level event, meaning that everyone who, is, um, who needs um, banking will in the future use a peer-to-peer -peer approach, meaning, of course, that everyone else who is providing those services at the moment will go extinct. It also means, since it's decentralized and open for everyone, well, this means um, more access for those who are currently unbanked. It will be a totally um, parallel um, solution to those things which we have nowadays. Furthermore, um, 
it also means, well, end of intermediaries and new token business models where we're able to, let's say, put value into those tokens. Let's put attention into a token. Let's put um, square meters into a token or ownership into a token. This is the idea. This is the threat. However, there are some buts, um, meaning, for example, that we don't have at the moment um, a killer use case in the size of PayPal. We don't have mass adoption from the users out there. I, I hope that after this talk you might uh, download an app and buy some Bitcoin. We don't have intuitive apps which are as easy to use um, and swipe, etc., cetera, um, because, well, it has to be secure. And we don't have stable um, courses, um, value exchanges. This is something users are uh, put off by. So, first theory. Facebook tries to use this, all of this Web3 in their own manner with their own rules. Because the plan is, well, they're threatened. Threatened by what? By, by four things. First of all, they're threatened by regulation. Like Microsoft in the 90s, they are threatened to be um, separated into different small entities. They're also threatened by, of course, new user behavior. Because, well, uh, in the West, more and more people are leaving Facebook. And um, it means the user base is decreasing. The third base is, um, let, me, let me check again. Oh, yeah. It's blind. It's blind to online to offline transactions. Uh, meaning that, of course, they see what you do online, but they don't see what you buy offline. This is what WeChat in China is doing. It's connecting both those worlds. And, of course, they're threatened by Web3 with those new business models, which are finding new ways of incentivizing um, attention and sharing content. So what tries Facebook to do? They use the threats and use Web3 as their own internet solution, their own internet of money, more or less. And this is what you can read in the white paper, meaning, OK, let's build a digital currency, stable and secure, based on real assets. This is a different from thing from, Facebook, from Bitcoin or so, governed by an independent association, meaning the foundation. It's also challenging here financial services. It should be cheaper and better. And it should be global infrastructure for billions of people. So to summarize, a private blockchain, smart, stable coins, an association, an investment fund, and also a Facebook wallet and IDs for everyone to share. That's the plan. Let's see how they really want to do it. So that's the ecosystem. Let's take a look. Um, this is everything on one page. Um, I have it from consensus. It's complex, but let's go through it step by step. Um, first of all, there's a Libra reserve. Every classical stable token out there in the world needs something to hold it, its value. Um, and this value should be re replaced um, one by one. And in here are 10 million invested by all the original founders. Um, this could be either um, 10 millions in yen or euro or, um, or US dollar, of course. It could be uh, short um, state bonds and uh, similar things like that. And um, Furthermore, so if you have, let's say, this copy over here, well, not the reserve over here, you can make a digital copy out of it and say, well, I have 100 million, let's print 100 Libra tokens at the same way. Um, this is how it, manage it manages and says, says um, well, here, here are my 100 million. Why are they printing it? Well, they have the reserve. This is how it normally works. Um, you have it stored there, you don't touch it, and you play with the digital currencies. However, Facebook or Libra is doing it a different way. This money hidden in here is not really um, untouched. It's actually in flow. It's reinvested over and over again, and therefore it gets an interest return, of course, for all uh, currently 28 founding members. Well, we have two problems here, actually. First of all, we have to trust that those 10 million actually have been invested and actually have a value in the digital Libra coin. And the second thing is, if you have, well, if you have, let's say, um, capital here, but you copy it in the digital, in the digital <coughs> version, but still use it in the analog version, well, you double the, the monetary supply, and wherever you use the, the Libra coin in a country, let's say, and somewhere in Africa or so, you actually double also the, um, the money supply for this country, meaning you increase the, the inflation, 
and you decrease, of course, the um, price, um, what's the word again? Price stability, uh, the Kaufkraft. Um, first problem, first two problems, uh, monetary way and also trust way. You have to trust they have invested this amount of money. Let's look at the, those who are controlling it. Um, the founding members are a diverse set of groups who are controlling what's happening in the code, what's happening with the investments, what the reserve should hold. And it's surprising if you look also on who is inside this association. Those are the biggest organizations out there. Of course, you, all those multinational payments, um, big economy, um, you have some user end uh, apps, you have also some NGOs, which is interesting because of course you want to include everyone else who is currently not in the financial system. This is the promise which was given, of course. Uh, and you also have some original uh, cryptocurrency representatives. Uh, Coinbase is an exchange trying, of course, to build uh, the access to the new crypto world for those, um, for those users who might jump in in the future. So there's a main benefit, of course, for those founders to join it, this whole, this whole um, the pay into reserve because they get interest. But also they're bu building a platform which is attracting more and more money, of course, by those who are trying to get into the, get into the ecosystem, um, those who are trying to get their hands on Libra. So it's, there are different, different um, benefits, of course, joining the platform. Let's look on um, the technical side, the Libra core code, uh, where the whole council and the council members are all owning a validator node. This means that it's not a blockchain over here, what we speak about, where everyone have a node if they download it. It's, in fact, a federated database, nothing else. So this means that not just that they play the, give the rules of how the whole system works, but they also validate if a transaction has happened. So on the one side, um, this is helpful for the system because it makes it secure. There are, there's no blockchain which is securing the transaction. There's only law, there's only contracts, and those actors, they all know each other, of course. So therefore, you don't invite a malicious actor who, which is incentivized to maybe hack or manipulate any transaction. So this is, first of all, good. It's also good in a way it's very fast. You know, blockchain is very, very slow, seven transactions per second. Uh, Libra promised to do 1,000 transactions per second. Well, not that fast as, uh, of course, Visa, but they might be able to scale it because they control the nodes. Um, and the last thing, which is very interesting if you look at the whole ecosystem, it's Calibra. Calibra is the wallet. It's the entry gate for everyone who wants to get their hands on Libra. And so in Calibra is also the way on how normal users buy and sell the fiat, the hard-earned fiat, into Libra, into those coins, which are promised to have value because we trust in the reserve. Um, it's, Calibra is open source, which is good as well, uh, meaning it attracts many open source developers who want to maybe include also further services from Calibra. But first of all, Calibra is just developed by Facebook developers, possibly the best ones in the world. If you just look on how addictive they made the Facebook app, so this might be in the future, the Calibra wallet, you, your Sophia, you simply select 100 pounds which you want to send to Eddie. Uh, it's Libra coins, but actually it's Mexican pesos. And there you go, with, three, with almost three swipes, you have transacted the money without extra fees, without, well, with direct settlement, and that's what, what's promised, and right away. And yeah, of course, very tasty, good looking design, so everyone would love to use this app, of course. This is uh, the current status, what's promised so far. I um, did my research, um, there's more to talk about certainly on what's all possible and happening in here. Uh, one aspect, of course, is if you, if you transact your euros into Libra coins, well, you get just one to one, or depending, of course, of the exchange rate. But uh, if you leave your money, of course, in Libra coins, well, you never get anything from the, from the um, interest, of course, which, is, which you actually pay into here. So you don't 
benefit at all from, let's say, the investments they do over here, while they, of course, earn the interest with, and money which you put into their reserve. So let's look on to more into analytic aspect. What's happening here? Sorry, I have to sk skip those slides. Um, yeah, this was the overview so far. Uh, if you have questions, we can do them afterwards. So I'm sorry if I'm also too fast. Give me a short sign, please. Yeah. Okay, let's look at the business model and what the income streams are in here. So first of all, of course, for Facebook and the net network, 100 million for every node they're able to sell. Uh, there's, of course, an, an exchange fee for every fiat currency you put into, um, into crypto. There might be also a transaction fee, very small one, still existing, but if you try to offer this wallet to well, everyone in the world, uh, of course, they sum up. And if you're able, of course, to provide a wallet to billions of people, well, you have, of course, a bank account in their hand, and you can also earn on all the additional personal banking services out there. Well, and of course, as I already said, interest fee for everyone in the network. So this means right away you have a digital banking account for 2.4 billion users just in, the, just in the Facebook ecosystem and a fund which is rather at the moment small to medium um, but still relevant to the whole ecosystem you all work in. Me as well, of course. So who do you think this is all targeted to? It's not Bitcoin. It's, of course, retail banking, traditional investors, uh, central banks. And so this is, in fact, an attack, not on crypto, but on everyone else of the traditional analog um, legacy system building financial industry. And um, this is the actual threat, I would say. Everyone might see or not, or just think, well, this is just digital bullshit, I don't care and they might be disrupted from the other way. And it's really interesting, of course, that Facebook is stepping into this personal finance um, market branch, and not just targeting, of course, 2.4 billion, but in fact, um, also including the 4.9 billion people who are not banked currently. And, well, definitely, it's a, an attractive market. Let's analyze if Libra is really able to, well, to sell any benefits and see, of course, if they, well, what's hindering them. So, first of all, they say better access by lower transaction fees, um, quick onboarding because they have the wallet for everyone else. It's open source for developers to improve and build. It's um, not a blockchain as set, it's, it's good for scale, it might scale faster. And yeah, well, I would say those things are all issues in the payments f sector, uh, faster, cheaper, more access, wider use, of course, um, more control for the user, so far they say. Well, for banking, of course, it's all mobile and it's crypto compatible. Uh, I would say one thing I forgot in here, of course, is with all the actors in there, so far 30, um, Facebook had also a good approach in terms of opening their closed walled garden to those 30 other partners and, and therefore, of course, opening also the opportunity to use Libra not just for the Facebook ecosystem, but for everyone else ecosystem as well. As you said, for Uber as well, for eBay as well. Also simply increasing the value of the, of the benefit using Libra uh, for all users and also increasing the value of course of all the networks because you have an, an, a payment tool which is without any friction moving money from all those, all those platforms um, without settlement um, friction, without time friction and without much cost. So this is the real great benefit and this is of course the thing which is Libra on the white paper is doing well. So. Um, what does it mean for everyone else? First of all, to be not just a shadow bank, they have to be, of course, regulatory compliant, meaning that they have to connect in their KYC process the analog identities of everyone and combine it with their digital identities and connecting it, therefore, also to those 
transactions they do on a daily basis. Since they see all transactions, see the identity, the pseudonym, digital identity, and the real analog identity, they're able to, well, of course, dis disclose your privacy and also surveil all transactions you do. This is good for their business because they are able to target your services and your needs better in a much more holistic way than possible. And the same way what Facebook is doing here, they are giving you also a so-called self-sovereign identity, which is um, not just like a Facebook identity, which is giving you access to those all social media tools, but um, might have the chance to be more, yeah, to jump over more borders. It's still limited. You have to have $10 million to get a note. Um, of course, it's distributed, but it's still a central point of failure. And with failure, I mean, it's able to be corrupted and it's able to be hacked. Um, they promise that they will be more decentral in the future. I doubt that. I doubt that because, um, let me just jump to the last point, because they are all corporations with shareholders. Their main purpose is to maximize their EBIT. And if you build, if you have to go to maximize your EBIT, well, you don't build on corporation. Corporation, sorry. And this also means if you look back to the R3 consortium, the lar largest bank consortium, which was attempting to somehow build a, a competitor to the crypto world, um, you see that they actually failed. The largest banks which founded this thing, they all went off to build their own thing. And well, actually, actually, because everyone want to have their own platform and be the king of this platform, uh, R3 wasn't possible to be built. So um, I would say this is the, the world, the current status we are in. And another benefit, of course, what Libra is giving us is, of course, it's free marketing. <laughs> it's, it helps all of us to, and everyone else who doesn't understand it yet, to know more about the crypto world, to hopefully, and this is also my a plan here to, educate more about what true crypto is, because now you saw what false and wannabe crypto is. And it gives us from the crypto world also more trust and sophistication that actually not only Bitcoin is able to do everything Libra is promising. Fast, secure, anonymous, um, free, uncensorable, distributed, all those things. Yeah. So um, I think I could check all theories so far. Um, maybe we can use it for discussion afterwards. Let me just use the last few minutes to talk about the other tools of the Web3. Um, oh yeah, the, the only reason, of course, for Libra is, of course, to get more, more money into, uh, into for, for Mark here and his partners. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Hope you also for you, Mark. Yeah. So in a summary, crypto is better than Libra in different, different ways. For example, so the Bitcoin Lightning Network is in a non-stopping force, which is making crypto payments faster and also without blocks possible. And the upcoming Ethereum um, updates, the Casper updates, will make smart contracts easier to deploy, more easy to, to code, and um, will avoid bottlenecks and also energy efficient, efficiency. This is this, those are the, let's say, the threats or the things which are stopping crypto from scaling at the moment. And crypto, for example, Steam, this one, is it's a social media platform which is incentivizing putting your content in there. You get actually those Steam tokens for, as for the likes you get with this content, content, and you trade those Steam tokens back into real cash. Well, real cash, sorry. Um, and a different token out there, which is challenging the Facebook's business model, is the BAT token. The basic attention token was founded by one of the Mozilla Firefox developers. And the goal is also to incentivize every click and like and ad you look, and therefore avoid the whole advertising and platform distributor model, which Facebook um, made so successful in Google as well, and also disrupted, or let's say, um, the internet which we have nowadays. And we have a competitor for Facebook. It's the Telegram super app. Telegram, with its very su successful ICO three years ago, developed a very stable and likable alternative to Facebook. And they also want to give it every user of Telegram their wallet, their crypto, 
payment solutions, social media, and um, yeah, those things, of course, on a smaller scale, but free for everyone to use. So this is, again, the tools which we should use instead of Libra and Facebook. Delete Facebook now <laughs> and uh, jump on the bandwagon. This is my talk so far. Um, I hope this was interesting to you. I know we just scratched the surface. Um, there are more topics to talk about, um, which we, you can also check on CryptoMonday.de. Uh, we have uh, videos about Libra, about um, if it's good or bad. Um, we have articles about the Brave browser, which is using the bad tokens. Um, and there are more topics to talk about. For example, um, what's, what are countries and central banks doing against this private central bank? How is are the G7 reacting? What is China doing with their own cryptocurrency? Uh, what Facebook is able to do with their open stand for digital identities? And what we, do we do against more surveillance? All relevant topics not to be covered in 20 minutes. I hope I didn't spoke more than that. Uh, sorry about that. Um, and I thank you for your time. Uh, I leave it um, to this slide. Um, put it in your bookmarks and hopefully see you there as a visitor and next time again to infinity. Thanks. <laughs>